All right, buddy, on the podcast, also on YouTube, great episode for you. Hit us with the beats. We're talking about the rotation coming up, a gluttony of talent, and yet it comes at a price. Are some of the young stars on the Brooklyn Nets going to suffer at the hands of the veteran addition? Plus, uh, sore muscles, I guess, is also a big talking point. Uh, it's all here for you on the podcast today. 240 minutes and way overboard on a, on a home project from yesterday. You're going to hear about it all, but after the three theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, yo. All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast and the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. I'm Doug Norrie, owner-operator, DFSR.com. Football is getting started. If you're putting in lineups on FanDuel, and or DraftKings, head on over to DFSR.com, get, uh, get some projections over there. And that is Adam Armbrecht, the voice of the Brooklyn Nets on Sportscaster, also the host of the One Giant Podcast. He's getting ready for football as well with his boy, Andy Mack. Buddy, how are we doing on a Friday? I feel good. I feel powerful. Uh, and I feel like there's still more questions here after having our conversations around moving off the Andre Jordan, bringing in Millsap, bringing in LMA. Now the question is, how do these rotations play themselves after the Brooklyn Nets this season? And are some of our young stars going to find themselves waiting in the wings? I just feel sore because <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> because uh, yesterday, Adam, Adam, I was going to skate right over this right here. But uh, Adam made an absolute hero effort yesterday, came and helped me with the deck project that I was working on. I estimated the project at five hours, um, again, based on almost nothing, <laughs> except the, me looking at the deck and thinking five sounds about right. A can-do spirit. Lasted about 10. Job still not done. <laughs> and I don't want to say like a younger version of myself would have looked at this version of myself with some sort of abhorrence slash embarrassment around how difficult I made things sound <laughs> around the physical e effort of it. Um, and so maybe that's like worming its way into where I am today, but I just feel sore. I mean, I'm ready to talk about the Nets front court because that's it, but I'm just letting you know on a physical level, um, this guy's getting old. <laughs> I don't tell you, this guy can't put in the same the same level of in the 90 degree heat that he used to be able to do without complaining pretty incessantly. You know, I, I was monitoring that pretty closely about how many times I brought up the heat, the, the state that my body was physically in, because <laughs> at a certain threshold, you go, all right, buddy, yeah, I know. I asked you to come here and help me. Now you're just kind of belaboring it. We have to get through it, which we did. And, and we'll circle back on it because you mentioned the front court for the Brooklyn Nets and it, it's a crowded room now. So we, we mentioned it on one of the last episodes about Nicholas Claxton and how, I mean, is he going to have minutes? That was kind of the, the the cliffhanger we left it with and or what is possibly a new role going to look like for him. What's your initial take? Because I think, I think there is a path for him to find a role on this team that will look different than last year. But this is probably one of those things where you always total up the minutes in a game and everybody has to get their bite at the bite at the basketball. And at some point you go, Oh, there's just not enough left for you. And that's, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. So, okay. So we mentioned this sort of tangentially or in passing on the previous two episodes where we talked about the Deandre Jordan trade. And we talked about then kind of more importantly, the, the Millsap signing and then the Marcus Aldridge signing where we talked about how, you know, that's all, all of a sudden the nets went from a situation with, I think we'd still gone into the season saying front court was still a need. For the mm -hmm. team, size, overall relative size was still a need for the team. And over the course of a weekend, it kind of thought it all of a sudden started looking overcrowded. Like we were in a situation where there was almost too many guys. And my first reaction after after the reaction was like, okay, that the DeAndre, DeAndre trade was great, the Millsap signing great, Aldridge signing great. All that all every single one of those moves across the board, total A pluses for the Nets. Yeah. After we get past that grading system, though, we have to look really at you know, developmentally where the Nets can even find minutes to be able to bring along, bring along a guy like Claxton. I forget they aren't sharp, right? I like, I don't even know where that lands. And you probably have, I know you have some thoughts on that, but I, I have real, real concerns at this point that there is not a clear path to Claxton playing significant minutes short of 
Nets really deciding to go all in on rest during the regular season. That's a possibility or injuries, which is also a possibility when you factor in the age of these guys. Yeah. But um, I know Nets fans want nothing to be excited about Claxton. We are too. Uh, athletically, he's great. But when you look at this roster now, I, I just there's a there's a, a significant numbers crunch happening now that wasn't happening as of midweek last week. <laughs> and 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 the odd man out in my mind is probably going to be Claxton. Yeah, so quickly, you mentioned Dayron Sharp. I, I think we had our, our concerns around him ahead of the draft, and you get all these glowing reviews about his shooting touch, whatever. The Nets make these moves, bring in, get rid of DeAndre, bring in Millsap, bring in LMA. That's it. Dayron Sharp is going to be an in-the-background developing, and that's fine, but you can go ahead and dismiss the idea of him having kind of a, a real role on this team, and I don't think that, that, that that's a good thing. You'd rather be having these veteran players uh, on this squad. From a Claxton standpoint, now I think what you, you need to look at is where does his skill set fit in and complement the players that you've brought in? Because we currently are going to have now, in this position list, but four or five-ish, LMA, Millsap, Blake Griffin back there as well, and then you put Kevin Durant just into that mix. So those are four bodies there. And I don't. the question becomes where can Nick Claxton fit Complement as a compliment piece to those players on the floor. And I think you, you fleshed out what right at the top makes or does not make sense from the combos. And let's just, starting with Kevin Durant, right? Who can play with him and almost anybody can, but then how some of these guys can't play with one another. Okay. So, right. So when it comes to position positions of basketball, um, there's been sort of a changing of the guard around how teams view positions. And it's very easy when you create a depth chart, in your, in, as a fan, to create a depth chart that says this guy's a center, this guy's a power forward, this guy's some all forward, this guy's shooting guard, this guy's point guard, and for some players, it's very obvious where they land. Like, um, oh, let me like Steph Curry is just a point guard, okay, right? Like, there's um Trey Young is a point guard, Joel Embiid is a center. Those guys, when we talk about positionless pieces, there's there's some there's a lot of fluidity, but not necessarily all the way around on every player. The problem is, I think sometimes when the Nets fans look at this Nets roster, they say to themselves, oh, we have these two guys, these three guys are centers, these three guys are power forwards, and you know, these are small forwards and shooting guards and point guards. In practice, it does not look like that. With the, these guys don't necessarily, like, so I'll, I'll give you a, on Nets, Billy Reinhardt, he's the best. Um, he's a really, really good guy. He's been on this podcast a bunch. Uh, this is not me taking a shot at him. I'm just going to break down. Uh, how he viewed the Nets positional depth chart. I would generally agree with this, but I'm going to point out why it's problematic. So starters, Harden, Irving, Durant, Millsap, Aldridge. Okay, I think that's fine. Whatever we, we argue with about where Joe Harris is going to be. But then when you look at the list, he's got Millsap and then Griffin as a power forward, then James Johnson. Okay, hard to argue. Aldridge is a center. Claxton is a center. De'Aaron Sharp is a center. Hard to argue. The problem is in the old way of viewing basketball, teams would play their centers and their power forwards together because that was just how the position sort of broke down. Mm -hmm. And this is what you would just do because you had a power forward and you had a power center. And sometimes you would throw out the window, whether that was actually the right combination to play. Right. It's proven out that, that it's not because so many teams are, have so much fluidity around it. So I guess my, my long winded point here is when you look at the depth chart for the nets, now you can talk yourself into, well, these three guys are centers. These four guys are power forwards. And this is how they're going to get all the minutes out of them. But it's, I just can't see it working that way in, yeah. in in actual when they actually put it into action. And I can get more into that. Does that make sense? Well, I, yeah, well, I can explain it more. But like, does that make sense what I'm saying first about like there's a very much a difference between what you get lab what you are labeled as on just the media guide about what position you play as compared to how that actually translates to real life basketball minutes? Because it doesn't really translate, I think, a lot of the way fans think that it does. Yeah, because a, a given whatever labeled as a center, a given center, okay, but they have different skill sets. So those complement the rest of your roster in different ways. So every time that you bring in player X positionless, once you bring in this player, okay, how is the rest of the group around them balanced out? So to the point, we always talk from the top down here. Well, Kevin Durant, well, what if the Nets want to go super small ball and put Kevin Durant at the five? Now what balances off behind him? You don't just automatically say, well, where's my power forward group and who am I going to put out there with him or vice versa? So 100% labeling these guys is what you have to do, so to speak, when you when you look at, you said, the, the player guide. 
but it mean it really means nothing. It's about the best combination of five players on the court, regardless of if they're labeled as six centers on a five, on a five man team. I do math, or or or, or likewise. You know what I mean. 100%. And I have a couple more thoughts. I, would, I would actually, we can, Adam and I can explain this a little better, and even in terms of last season, about why, and and I think to kind of paint the picture of why there's real concerns about Claxton specifically here, and maybe some other guys as well. First, got to talk to you about our friends over at Bet Online. It's that time of year again. Eyes are turning to the aforementioned football teams are back on the gridiron to start the season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. You can get all the updated odds, props, and contests. They have online's biggest half-million-dollar NFL mega contest. Go get in on that. Also, the world's largest $200,000 NFL survivor contest. You sweat out picking a winner each week. It's all over at Bet Online. You head on over to Bet Online right now. You sign up today. It's got to be a new account for this. You're going to get a 100% welcome bonus, but you have to use the promo code Locked On, just like our podcast network. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports, football, basketball, boxing, even Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the great offers for this 2021 season. Bet online, promo code locked on. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. And I'm certain this sounds familiar to everyone. You've got one device that lets you catch the games live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports and highlights on your phone, and you're begging your next door neighbor for the login to all the other streaming services to get in on the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get the, all that entertainment you love without the hassle, and it's a great and easy way where you finally get your TV all together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch all your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no more going to buy another device ever again. And the best part is there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible devices required. Content varies by package. And speaking of packages, Doug, before we get into, because I do think I have, I have a thought around how Nicholas Claxton can still find minutes and find a role on this team. We'll go back to last year and specifically around this, this positionless basketball or balancing the rotations and why it isn't just one-to-one of here's your position. Here's your minute share. Okay. So it's very easy actually. And this is a way that's going to play out. This is going to show, I think Nets fans about sort of what I'm talking about guys that kind of played center for the Nets last year. Okay. Blake Griffin. We obviously saw him play center. Uh, in the playoffs because that's who that's who they started effectively at the position. He was great, whatever. Um, other players that play center at times, which is meaning there's five guys on the court and who's basically guarding the other team's center or being put into that situation the most. Jeff Green. Okay, no one's labeling him as a center. So, you know, you, you could talk about whether he's a power forward or a small forward. Bruce Brown played offensive center, right? Like he would handle, he would start a lot of his actions, sort of top of the key, foul line extended. Um, we saw him roll to the basket a lot. No one in... No, in no world situation, whatever would label him a center. This is why the depth chart piece gets thrown out the window very, very quickly yeah. is because we just saw this put into practice around this team last season. Now, maybe you want to say, well, they were forced into that situation because they had no other options. I can hear that. The problem is Nick Claxton was on this team during those situations, <laughs> right? And, and we already saw sort of what, how that played out. So, I, I, okay. I could say to myself, like I could say to myself, well, let me guess about Paul Millsap's uh, rotations. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been on the team before. I can make a guess. Aldridge, we saw a little of it, right? We saw a little of where, where they stood with him. Claxton was on this team the whole time. <laughs> and, and, all, and all they did was fill the roster with guys who could probably play instead of him. Yeah. And I think that is, and I hate to say it that way, but because I really, really want to see what he can become. But does that mean do you feel the same way? I'm just starting to get very when I look at this, I'd say, like, what is the path for him to stay on this team? I, I just don't, especially coming up with the contract next year. This is it'd be, it's a very weird time for him. Well, and it's funny, too, because you do mention the contract and the one side piece here is like I think a lot of, of Nets fans and his conversations are around. Remember, he's coming up for an extension. Should the Nets want to do that? You think back to the Jared Allen in very different skill sets, all that stuff. I think that Nick Claxton is his development and upside is far different and mo potentially more impactful long-term on any team than Jared Allen. Uh, Jared Allen, a bit of that traditional kind of rim protector guy, doesn't have the outside shot. I think that Allen projects to develop in that vein, whereas the defensive versatility alone, I think, is a nicer upside piece. But, plus the fact the extension's talking about, I can't remember, it's a 50 million or something like that. The numbers are far less 
impactful than what Allen ended up signing ultimately in Cleveland. The the funny thing is, is that if that my first take was, yes, this has become crowded, but even with all these players that they've brought in, Nicholas Claxton does still offer versatility defensively. He can defend any position on the floor. Now, he's still going to get beat up by some of the bigger bodies, per se, in and around the basket, but you can use him in a lot of unique ways. So the switching becomes better. LMA is going to struggle in that area of the game. Blake Griffin, while I think played very admirably, you also look at that and say there's going to be some limitations where you can move him to. So you start to think you can balance the books a little bit with Claxton and put him in there. The funny thing that you just brought up about last year, playing Bruce Brown out of position. Well, all of a sudden, when you bring in Millsap, LMA, return Griffin, you have Kevin Durant. Okay, Bruce Brown is going to, I would think, be able to settle back into a much more traditional guard role. And then you can use him specifically in defensive matchups because that's what he excels at, which ironically actually does diminish some of the positionless basketball value of a Nicholas Claxton because you go, okay, is Claxton a bigger body? He can obviously defend to the rim more than Bruce Brown can. But in terms of where these players plug in, all of a sudden you have more balanced defensive value across this roster too, which diminishes what the strongest piece of his game is in Nicholas Claxton. And that's being able to pick anybody up on that side of the floor. I still do believe though that his rebounding is probably a pretty unique skill set relative to even the other guys that you've brought in here in terms of the bigs. But you mentioned even, I, I'm, I'm circling myself here because you mentioned last episode how James Harden is one of the best rebounding guards in the game. So it's this weird, there's this real weird swarth of skill sets and talents that they've brought in for this season where to your point, Claxton is talented enough to warrant minutes, but I don't know if the Nets are going to feel like they need to give him the minutes, if that makes sense. Yeah, see this, and this is where this is where they might. And th- by the way, this is like what you would call an embarrassment of riches around your uh, around your team. This is these are the good kind. Of, these are the good kinds of problems to have. This is the exact opposite of what the Nets were dealing with last year, which is to say we can't even find functional bodies to be able to effectively throw out there for long yeah. minute stretches because we're so banged up that we just can't. Like, what's what's the solution here? We're gonna play Blake a lot. Jeff Green can't play. Bruce Brown's like effective in some ways, but it's really hard for him against the Bucs, right? Like this is the, they were having all kinds of other problems on the opposite ends of the spectrum last year. They cured a lot of that, at least on paper right now. So this is not a complaint about that. This is more of a, you know, where does it fit in? You mentioned James Harden. It's interesting about him. Uh, one thing that is interesting about Claxton is Harden. See, Harden is so good about working with dynamic athletic bigs mm-hmm. that playing with Harden more, like you can make a real case to keep making sure that he plays with Harden as much as possible because Harden unlocks so much around what bigs athletic rim running bigs can do that um and I wouldn't like call Aldridge and Millsap those kind of guys necessarily even though I think that he can help them. But Clax um, is the only athletic big on this team you would argue, right? Uh, yeah, probably. I guess I was going to call Blake sort of in that same mold, yeah. but I think you're correct. Um, right. So in terms of just sheer athleticism, yes, he is probably the most athletic. He's the least skilled uh, by far of that group. So um, I don't think that's even in even under debate. But if he, but his minutes would look great if he could be compared because his games with Harden last year were really, really good. Yeah. If you go back and look at the times where Harden was actually when they were actually able to share the court, like back in uh, April, um, uh, excuse me, no, in March. Claxton had some of his best games, like a 16 point, a couple of 16 point games, bunch of rebounds and 11 and eight. You know, this is when this is when Harden is actually on the court playing a lot of minutes. Uh, and was like and was dominating sort of the offensive side of the ball and running the offense like that. We saw really great minutes from Claxton, very exciting stuff from Claxton during that time. Mm-hmm. And that is really one to one attributable to what James Johnson, not James, James Harden can do. Uh because we talked about it before, James John just is like he's a he's the big man unlocker. Like if you have if you have hands and have, and can finish above the rim at all, then he is going to make you look awesome. And that's where I hope that they don't maybe lose sight of that w- when it comes to Claxton, because I think that um, among that group, Harden can unlock him the most, and yet he still is fourth in line in terms of minutes. So I'm not even sure the other feel the need to actually do it. Yeah, and I, and, I, and, I, and this is where I wonder if the investment, like you said, well, are you resting some of the veterans throughout the course of the season? But I think this is where the value of utilizing him, and why I would have made the case for using him more last year, even if it was through some struggles, because you're going to find spots, even in the playoffs, where, again, his skill set would make a lot of sense, even for a small sample size, whatever. 
but only if you've invested the time to make sure that that's solved science so you know you can rely on him in those spots. If you truncate him and you kind of stash him on the bench all year, well, then it becomes less and less likely as you get down the stretch that you think you'll see any of them in the playoffs. And when you think about these players that they've added, again, Claxton is still a nice complementary skill set that I think has value, probably arguably more so in playoff basketball for key spots than at any point during the regular season. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And so again, we're talking about and and they're just the nets are so stacked at this point that this is the kind of problems you have to sort of make up for your <laughs> make up for yourself around around where the roster is going. Uh, we'll close out some of these roster thoughts heading into the weekend. First, you were dealing with car issues right now. You were thinking about going to the local chain place to go get a part for your car. Maybe you're a do it yourself or out there. Look, you got a computer, you got a cell phone. That's effectively all the car, the local place is using themselves. They're you're telling them to make a model of your car. They're typing in the make a model of your car. You're, you're telling them the part you need. They're just going to type in the part you need. And the one difference is being they're going to go back into the back of the store and try to find it for you in some maybe unmarked box, whereas you can just see it right there on Rock Auto. Know what the price is and know that it's thirty or fifty percent better than those local chain stores. Rock Auto is also a family-owned business that's serving those do-it-yourselfers for over twenty years. Rock Auto prices reliably low for every customer. They have everything you need. Car parts, a lot of parts on a car. More than 10, less than 10,000. Somewhere in there, if I'm just rounding, you go to rockauto.com right now. You see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on. And how did you hear about us? So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. And of course, no matter when Nicholas Claxton gets on the floor for the Brooklyn Nets, you know he'll be ready. If he needs that little boost of energy, he's going for Built Bars. Why? Because they're delicious. It's a protein bar that has great texture and flavor without any of that weird kind of cardboardy version you get from some other products. Delicious flavors, as I say, like coconut, cherry, barcia, raspberry, mint brownie, double chocolate from my man, Doug. I'm more of a salted caramel man myself. Strawberry, orange, cookies, and cream. And not only are Built Bar flavors the best tasting, but they're also healthy too. 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories just 130 to 180, for only 4 to 5 grams of sugar, only 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. Amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy for you, friends. For me, you can head over right now and get them. My personal flavor this week is actually a little bit of German chocolate. And Built Bar is always ready for you with an offer. Is you can go to built.com and use promo code locked on, and you'll get 15% off your first order. Promo code locked on for 15% off at built.com. The other, the other piece that I will say, so there's the one part of it actually, my mind flashed back to when when Claxton was first developing, and you and I were speculatively hoping in a preseason games that uh Maybe Claxton will shoot from the perimeter. That never quite developed for us. Did we? That would have been, it, it is almost yeah. funny because that would have been the ultimate, that would have been the ultimate piece as a complimentary player like him. If you had a little bit of a perimeter shot, now you're really creating value for yourself. The other thing that I think is interesting when we talk about this roster is as it stands right now, there's a lot of these other bo bodies that came in, right? Dumboya came in from, De from Detroit in that trade. You have Bembry on the roster still right now. I'm not going to get into say Kessler Edwards, you know, rookie on a two way. But, but how those, I think how those positions, then James Johnson, throw him in, in there as well. How those players, what happens with all of those players? Are they all on this roster? Are some of them getting moved? Do you need to create it to, to finalize your, your roster for the regular season? Theoretically, if a couple of those bodies aren't here, now Claxton, again, in a very different role, is still going to have a minute share in every game when somebody needs X amount of rest. And so that's the difference too, because some of these other players, like a Bembry, again, he has great defensive upside. He has versatility, plays at a smaller at a smaller position, but you can use him in that same capacity. And the, not the problem, but if you look at this and say the Nets saw what happened last year, they went ahead and made themselves a very deep team, brought in a lot of veteran talent. Every indication here is that the Nets are leaning veteran heavy, and that is what Claxton is not. And that's probably the biggest indication of saying, is he going to have an opportunity to get out there on the court? So, I mean, do you see some of these other names as being bodies that may or may not be here? Are, are, are any of these guys flyer guys that the Nets could quickly move off of? And if if they stay, does that impact where Claxton's role is here? And I'll even throw an extra caveat. I mean, is there a world where because we know Claxton is coming up for an extension potentially that the Nets are also looking at him as just like a Jared Allen? We built up his value. Now we can move him for something if we want to and continue to tweak this roster. Yeah, I thought about that and I kind of didn't want to say it because I, I don't know, it'd be, a, it'd be a bummer, but that is the other thing to think about here. And so you, 
Okay, so the, where the Nets are right now is they still have, I think they're one or two guys over on their roster size right now. And I, the conventional wisdom says that Jaleel Okafor is going to get cut, and I think that's probably correct. I think the other guy to probably go is DeAndre Bembry. He has a non-guaranteed contract. That would be the easiest money to get off of and not really cause you too much impact to the uh, your cap hit. So um, he probably logically is the next one to go. But in terms of just having even more depth everywhere, so I, I should probably not say, I was thinking this before as we were talking about it, I shouldn't call this positionless basketball. We should call it more like position fluidity because there are still positions. Like we just said, Joel Embiid is not going to play point guard, right? <laughs> Steph Curry is not playing center. We know these things to be true. And so as long as you can say those things definitively, then you can't say it's positionless because I, I just said that this one guy can't play the one position, right? So like we have to agree. I'm, I'm going back and reforming my my original claim, which is this position list. I'm going to call it it's pl position fluid. <laughs> and front court, front court, back court, right? Front court, back court, and even up a bit too. Even, even that, that gets, I know even that was a bit of a that's even that's a bit blurry. <laughs> so okay, so where I'm going with that is where players tend to lose the guys who tend to lose minutes in this new form of basketball is like kind of like unless you're elite, the bigger you are, your minutes start to fall off. This is mm -hmm. what happens for every team. This is why centers have become sort of under. Uh, well, not undervalued. They become sort of everyone just swaps around these starting centers now in the offseason for the most part because there's just a bunch of these guys. When it comes down to it, very few of them can actually stay on the court when it really counts. And when you look at how minutes break down on a basketball team, where those where those minutes start to get cut is around the starting center and the backup centers because they just you just find other ways to play, right? Yeah. We again we have this exact example from last year with this very team. Now maybe you want to say. Well, Oh, hey, never mind. They, they have a okay. Never mind. I rounded myself into this point because <laughs> they had a guy who was a only can play center guy, and that guy did not sniff the court for the last fifteen games of the season, and they just had to give away like eight for second round draft picks to get off the contract in DeAndre Jordan. So if you're trying to look at where minutes get cut, this is where they get cut. the The closer you get to only being a five is the closer you get to having your minutes cut unless you are absolutely elite. Nikola, Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid, I guess I'm going to throw Gobert in there. It's close because he got basically almost played off the court in the playoffs last year, right? So um, unless you're those guys that are clearly just centers, that is where the minutes come. That is where the minutes disappear the quick, the, the fastest. And Claxton is... That's, he's pretty darn close to just that, right? And so I just I, I, it just becomes there's 240 minutes for a team in a basketball game, and if you're looking where the numbers start to fall off, it's around that position. And I, and I wonder too, because I'm sure I'm, I'm going to try to offer you the opportunity to do the slow math in the background here. When you think about well, if I say in the 240 minutes I'm going to earmark Aldrich for 20, you know, 20 yeah. to 25 at most, like 20 for him, 20 for Millsap, 20 for Griffin. Does you know? Does that start to massage a minute share for a player like Claxton? Because none of those guys are going to be players that get that 30 to 35 minute run with consistency. Now you have to look in then to the backcourt and how they're going to utilize Bruce Brown. And we know that in theory, Irving and Hardner are both going to be earmarked for 30 to 35, as is Kevin Durant. So that, that's the space where I wonder if there is 15 ish minutes for Nicholas Claxton in this. And then the, uh, the other pieces I, 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 that I will say, when you look at, when you look at LMA and you look at Millsap, Griffin is the outlier here. And this is actually probably which is, is what's damning for Nicholas Claxton's minutes as well. Because Blake Griffin, as you said, maybe he's not going to be hard fast to that role that he brought to the team last year. But he is, a, he is a rebounding guy. He is, out of those three players, probably the most athletic for whatever that's worth now. And that's the piece where when you have this much offensive talent on a team, not every team can almost very few teams can do this where you can just sacrifice pure defense out of one position. And that's probably the extra piece. Can you sacrifice 15 minutes a game? And I say sacrifice, not negatively, but can you give 15 minutes a game to a player who's going to rebound, run the floor, be able to get at the rim and play defense with a versatility? If you, if you feel like you can always plug that in with shooting and scoring around them, then I think it is okay. And Unlike DeAndre Jordan last year, I think Nicholas Claxton still does have a lot of offensive upside. The question is, how much has that developed from last year to this year? How much can it develop over the course of the season? He's going to need to show you that he's not James Harden dependent to be successful offensively, as opposed, you know, as opposed to saying, well, only if we're out running the floor and I'm in space, can I be effective? You're going to need to be able to, we'll say this, 
work to pick and roll. One of the reasons why DJ was used so much during the regular season last year is because he was at least effective in that role at the top of the key. Class is going to need to show court awareness, spatial awareness on the offensive end to increase that value as well. Yeah, so even just back of the napkin math on the minutes looks even probably worse <laughs> now that I've actually I wasn't, just, I wasn't like, sure when I laid my, it out. I was like, this could either go, I, I could be leading him into a great point or saying, actually, no, man, maybe three minutes is probably the number. Yeah, it might be uh, like because, OK, so I, we'll run this really quick because we're going to start go over. We'll, we'll break this down a little bit more a clearer lines next week because there's a lot to unpack here at the end. Even even being very reasonable around the Nets minutes, I got to like 220 minutes and I hadn't even put in Cam Thomas, James Johnson, Nick Claxton um, and a few other guys even into right. the mix. And I was at 220 already. And that was even being conservative around the bigs because like who's who's not losing minutes? Durant's not losing minutes. Uh, Kyrie's not losing minutes. James, uh, if all healthy, James Harden's not losing minutes. Okay. So we can all agree on that. The other three veterans are going to want to play too. Um, I, I can't imagine any of them came back here to do 10 minutes a game. Right. So that like, so, um, you have to think, I think your reasonable assessment around 20 is probably the low point for any one of those guys. And you have to just, I only, I stayed at your 20, but mm -hmm. if you trend higher, you can start to see where this is going. Yeah. So th that's uh 60, 90, 120, 150, 160. I said 35 minutes for the superstars. Like that's like 175 just for that group. Then you get Joe Harris in there. Okay. That's that 25 plus. At least you get Bruce Brown back in there. You get Patty Mills back in there. Yeah. All of a sudden that number is sitting at like two. two I, I was just doing this on this thing. That's sitting around 220 right now. That's 20 minutes left. That's if you're all healthy. Okay. So I get that this, well, this doesn't work. It, you know, guys are going to rest and whatnot. You're sitting 20 minutes left in the, in the game for those other guys that we want to see play. <laughs> and this is, this is why I'm saying when you start looking at it this way, it really becomes a situation where it just becomes a situation where it's just a numbers game. Like there's just no more numbers because some guys just, their numbers are not moving. The, Kevin Durant in a regular right. game, Kevin Durant's James Harden and Kyrie Irving's movement minutes are not moving. Right. And those other three veterans, those are probably probably not moving either. And so when you look at that, you just run out of time. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Like I, I would say the one only, thing. Go ahead. Bru no, just, and, you know, Bruce Brown. You, you say Bruce Brown, his minutes are probably flexible coming to this year. New role for him. So maybe, and I'm not even, I'm not trying to make the case. I, by the like, way, I had him at 10 minutes in this scenario. Yep. So there you go. <laughs> and I was going to say, like, if you take a look at him and you throw in Javon Carter and you throw in Cam Thomas and you say, well, that's anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, maybe all together could be 30, you know, in totality. But depending on where that needle falls, that's where maybe you find this niche. And the, but in the bottom line being is in almost every scenario, you'd probably make the case for one of those players to get a run here, some minute shares there, maybe as opposed to a Nicholas Claxton. And I guess I just, it'll be interesting to see, man, because if, if the Claxton ends up in a garbage time kind of role or off day role, when, when some of the stars or bigs need rest, I, you can still find value there over the course of the season, but it would certainly be a, a vast difference from where his trajectory was just a season ago. Look, I don't know how to estimate how long it takes to replace a deck in your backyard. What I do know, <laughs> what, what I do know how to estimate is how many, how minutes break down around NBA lines. I, this is, I mentioned what I've done this as an everyday full-time job for like the last seven years. Uh, I just, I do know how this breaks down and this is just kind of what happens. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic about it because I love Claxton, but um, you know, just go 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 add it up yourselves. <laughs> go <laughs> go add up what minutes you think each guy should play every game. Make set it to minus two forty and start subtracting it off and see what you're left with and see what reasonable number for a healthy team is left. And this is what happens when you're a really really great team. Their to nets are totally stacked. So um, what a, what a bummer on a, such a positive thing. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's, it is, it's just, it's the, it's the, it's what happens when you're a really good team. By the way, we're probably going to be here in like March and so thankful that the Nets have so much depth because they're dealing with six injuries. And at, like, and this is just, this is the beginning of the season stuff. I, I get the thing that look, the situation changed and Nets dealt with so many injuries last year. It's bound to happen again. They're, they're pretty long in the tooth. So there's going to be opportunities. I'm just saying to start the year, don't expect this to. Maybe we'll, we'll be happy to have the depth later, I'm sure. Okay, look, I, I didn't mention the top, but we're also doing the, all this on YouTube now. You got to go visit our Locked On Nets YouTube channel. It's up and running. A lot of hits on the first couple of videos. So we're really, really excited about that. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel as well, just like you're subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen. Uh, these episodes will be going up there. You'll be able to see our purdy faces um, as I work through my my sore muscle injuries today. Uh, but it's all the, the link for the YouTube channel will be in the show notes. So make sure you just click over there, hit subscribe, and you'll get us uh, every day over on YouTube. Yeah, you better believe it, man. I don't know if visually rubbing, you know, 
icy hot on my body during the show is going to be good or bad, but we'll test the waters. We talk about balancing the roster, friends. Nature is about balance. All the world comes in pairs, yin and yang, right and wrong, men and women. What is pleasure without pain? Angie Jolie. Oh, one of the all-time great poets. Better when she was with Brad Pitt. Uh, we'll be back oh. again. We'll be back again next week talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.